Okay, guys, so Sean Combs is accused by Cassie of rape and years of abuse in lawsuit. We are going to take a look at the filing. We're going to summarize it, and we're also going to do a full case reading, so you can use the timestamps if you want to navigate to that. Whatever you do, make sure you hit the like button on the way in. But in short, Cassie Ventura says that Mr. Combs, or Diddy, or Puff Daddy, subjected her to a pattern of control and abuse over about a decade's worth of time. Mr. Combs has denied the allegations. We're going to look into them. As a case sneak peek, you'll see that Cassandra Ventura is the plaintiff. It's a civil case. What we're looking at here is the complaint, which was filed today in a federal district court in Manhattan. And it was filed against Diddy. You see his official name, Sean Combs, but it also lists Bad Boy Entertainment, Bad Boy Records, Epic Records, Combs Enterprises, LLC. So we'll see if they have more information on that. But that looks like something that is a a catch-all for assets, entities, businesses that they weren't able to identify at the time of filing this complaint. But they could become known during discovery. And if you're wondering, why is Cassie filing this suit against Diddy now? That's a valid question. And there can be valid answers. And in this case, Cassie's filing this lawsuit in the Federal District Court of Manhattan under the Adult Survivors Act. That's a New York law that allows people who say they were victims of sexual abuse to file civil suits after the statute of limitations has expired. The Adult Survivors Act is actually ending on November 24th, so a week from now. We're going to see a statement from her saying that this is why she's filing this. For context, if you are totally unfamiliar with Cassie and Diddy, it's been a long time since they first started dating. It's been a long time since they've broken up. Here's a quick Cassie and Diddy relationship timeline. So Diddy and Cassie dated for about 10 years on and off between 2007 and 2018. They met while Cassie was modeling for Sean John, which is Diddy's clothing line. That's her and Lauren London in this picture wearing Sean John. Cassie ended up signing to Bad Boy Records. That's Diddy's label. They had met because Ryan Leslie was like, oh, Cassie, you're talented. Let's do songs together. And then Diddy wanted to also have Cassie on his label for the release of her first album. This is when rumors started circulating that they were dating on and off, but Diddy was still dating Kim Porter until 2009, so who knows. They publicly announced that they were a couple in 2012. In 2015, they broke up, according to page six. And I'll link that article on my scratch pad, but there was hints that someone said that they saw her talking and being flirty like she was single, but it didn't say who the witness was. In 2016, they broke up again. This time, the police were called, according to TMZ. Diddy had taken Cassie's phone. He gives it back. A report was filed. They end up getting back together. In 2018, Diddy and Cassie broke up. Cassie is currently married and has a child with Alex Fine. They married in August of 2019. I think they have two kids now. Or maybe she's pregnant with kid number two. I'm not sure. And Diddy has been dating Carisha from the City Girls. So everything we're about to look at here, the New York Times is the first one to release this. So we're going to read it from them. They are basing this on the complaint. And if you are going to stay tuned for the full complaint reading anyway, if you want to skip the summary and jump right to that, use the timestamps in the description. But let's jump into the summary. Let's get through it quickly. So Sean Combs, the producer and music mogul who has been one of the most famous names in hip-hop for decades, was sued in federal court on Thursday by Cassie, an R&B singer once signed to the label who accused Mr. Combs of rape and of repeated physical abuse over about a decade. In the suit filed in the Federal District Court in Manhattan, Cassie, whose real name is Cassandra Ventura, and who had long been Mr. Combs' romantic partner, says that not long after she met him in 2005 when she was 19, he began a pattern of control and abuse that included plying her with drugs, beating her, and forcing her to have sex with a succession of male prostitutes while he filmed the encounters. In 2018, the suit says, near the end of their relationship, Mr. Combs forced his way into her home and raped her. After years in silence and darkness, Ms. Ventura said in a statement, I'm finally ready to tell my story and to speak up on behalf of myself and for the benefit of other women who face violence and abuse in their relationships. In response, a lawyer for Mr. Combs, Ben Braffman, said, Mr. Combs vehemently denies these offensive and outrageous allegations. For the past six months, Mr. Combs has been subjected to Ms. Ventura's persistent demand of $30 million under the threat of writing a damaging book about their relationship, which was unequivocally rejected as blatant blackmail. Despite withdrawing her initial threat, Ms. Ventura and has now resorted to filing a lawsuit riddled with baseless and outrageous lies, aiming to tarnish Mr. Combs' reputation and seeking a payday. Douglas Wigder, was that? Okay, yep, so Douglas Wigder, he represented seven victims of alleged sexual misconduct by Harvey Weinstein, over 20 employees in a Fox News sexual harassment case, and he also represented Brian Flores. So that is a familiar name. So Douglas Wigder is a lawyer for Cassie. He said the parties had spoken before the suit was filed. 
Mr. Combs offered Miss Ventura eight figures to silence her and prevent the filing of this lawsuit, and he said she rejected his efforts. And then they go on about some other industry things. They note that his net worth has been estimated as high as $1 billion. And last year, Forbes calculated that Mr. Combs' annual earnings are $90 million, largely coming from his former partnership with Syrah. And then back to the subject of the complaint, Mr. Combs, who in his career has variously been known as Puff Daddy, Diddy, and Love, may be the most famous music executive of his generation. But the suit depicts Mr. Combs as a violent person who, beyond repeatedly assaulting Miss Ventura, asked her to carry his gun in her purse. And the suit suggests he was responsible for blowing up the car of a rival suitor. Now bookmark that. In one incident, the suit says, Mr. Combs dangled a friend of Miss Ventura's over a 17th floor hotel balcony. In naming additional defendants, the court paper asserts that others who worked with Mr. Combs had helped him to control Miss Ventura, at times by threatening her with retribution, like suppressing her music if she did not obey his orders, or by helping to conceal his behavior. The suit, which names Mr. Combs and a number of his associated companies as defendants, seeks unspecified damages. After they started dating, he soon began to assert an extraordinary level of command over her life. In addition to controlling her career, he paid for her car, apartments, and clothing, and even had access to her personal medical records. According to the suit, the results from an MRI scan she had for memory loss, possibly caused by drug use or by a beating she said she suffered from Mr. Combs, went directly to Mr. Combs. Mr. Combs also provided Ms. Ventura with a copious amount of drugs, including ecstasy and ketamine, and urged her to take them, the suit said, and often became violent, beating her multiple times each year. The suit says Ms. Ventura never went to the police because she feared it would merely give Mr. Combs another excuse to hurt her. In one incident in Los Angeles in 2009, the suit says Mr. Combs became enraged when, she, when he saw Ms. Ventura talking to another talent agent, then pushed her into a car and kicked her repeatedly in the face, making her bleed. According to the suit, Mr. Combs then had his staff bring her to a hotel room to recuperate for a week. She asked to go home to her parents, but Mr. Combs refused, the suit said. The suit says that after seeing the violent repercussions of rejecting Mr. Combs and the extent to which he would isolate her from her support network, Ms. Ventura felt that saying no to Mr. Combs would cost her something, her family, her friends, her career, or even her life. And though she tried to leave Mr. Combs, the suit says he sent his employees to lure her back. In one incident described in the court papers, Ms. Ventura says that in early 2012, Mr. Combs grew so angry about her dating the rapper Kid Cudi that he said he would blow up the rapper's car. Around that time, the suit says, Kid Cudi's car exploded in his driveway. Through a spokeswoman, Kid Cudi confirmed Ms. Ventura's account. This is all true, he said. A few years into Ms. Ventura's relationship with Mr. Combs, he began coercing her to engage in a fantasy of his called voyeurism, in which she was directed to have sex with a succession of male prostitutes while Mr. Combs watched, masturbated, took pictures, and shot video. Damn, he was perfect for the get him to the Greek role. Allegedly. According to the suit, Mr. Combs called these encounters freak-offs, which involved costumes like masquerade masks and lingerie. They continued for years, taking place at high-end hotels across the U.S. and in Mr. Combs' homes. The suit says that he instructed Ms. Ventura to search the websites of escort services to procure male sex workers. Drugs were supplied at these events, which Ms. Ventura's suit says she took because they allowed her to dissociate during these horrific encounters. According to the suit, Ms. Ventura would delete videos from these incidents that had been shot on her phone, but Mr. Combs told her that he still had access to those videos, and on a flight once made her watch a video she thought she had deleted. The suit says that as a result of these sexual encounters in different cities, Ms. Ventura was a victim of sex trafficking. The suit also accuses Mr. Combs of sexual battery, sexual assault, and violations of New York City's gender-motivated violence law. Ms. Ventura's suit includes several accounts of her unsuccessful attempts to escape Mr. Combs' control. In one example, the suit says that during a freak-off at a Los Angeles hotel in 2016, an intoxicated Mr. Combs punched Ms. Ventura in the face, giving her a black eye. He fell asleep and she tried to leave the room, but Mr. Combs woke up and followed her into the hallway, where he threw glass vases at her, sending glass shattering through the corridor, according to the court filing. The hotel security cameras captured that incident, but the suit says Mr. Combs paid the hotel $50,000 for the footage. The court filing says that in 2018, after Mr. Combs and Ms. Ventura met for dinner, he forced himself into her apartment and raped her while she repeatedly said no and tried to push him away. After that, the suit says, she left him for good. Ms. Ventura married Alex Fine, a personal trainer, the following year, and now has two children. According to the complaint, her association with Bad Boy ended in 2019. And in a statement, she addressed the importance of the Adult Survivors Act. With the expiration of New York's Adult Survivors Act fast approaching, she said, it became clear that this was an opportunity to speak up about the trauma I have experienced and that I will be recovering from for the rest of my life. So that's a summary of the case that Cassie or Cassandra Ventura is bringing against Diddy and Bad Boy Entertainment and a bunch of other businesses owned and operated by Sean Combs. 
We are going to jump into the full complaint and do the reading of it. I will link to everything I've talked about in the show notes and what I call my scratch pad. If you don't want to stay for this, hit the like button on your way out. Thanks for tuning in. Follow me on Twitter if you see anything new about this case or have a question. I'm always open to talk about it. But if you want to read the whole thing, let's dive in. You can see there is a big red trigger warning right here that says this document contains highly graphic information of a sexual nature, including sexual assault. All right, so let's go. Plaintiff Cassandra Ventura, who will be referred to as Ms. Ventura through the rest of this filing, hereby alleges, as and for her complaint against defendant Sean Combs, Mr. Combs, Bad Boy Entertainment, Bad Boy Records, Epic Records, Combs Enterprises LLC, and Doe Corporations 1 through 10, together, defendant corporations, and together with Mr. Combs, defendants, as follows. So we're going to look at the preliminary statement. Defendant Sean Combs is a rapper and record executive popularly known by his stage names Puff Daddy, P. Diddy, or Diddy. Mr. Combs came to fame in the early 1990s with his record label Bad Boy Records. He rose to prominence in the music and entertainment industry over the decades and is regularly referred to as a hip-hop mogul. Mr. Combs received the Lifetime Achievement Award at the BET Awards. During his acceptance speech, Mr. Combs stated, I have to give a special shout-out, thank you, love, to the people that was really there for me. He named a number of people before adding, and also Cassie, for holding me down in the dark times, love. The truth, however, is that Cassie, Miss Cassandra Ventura, was held down by Mr. Combs and endured over a decade of his violent behavior and disturbed demands. For Miss Ventura, the dark times were those she spent trapped by Mr. Combs in a cycle of abuse, violence, and sex trafficking. Among other violent and unlawful acts, Mr. Combs raped Miss Ventura in her own home after she tried to leave him, often punched, beat, kicked and stomped on Miss Ventura, resulting in bruises, burst lips, black eyes, and bleeding. Blew up a man's car after he learned that he was romantically interested in Miss Ventura. Forced Miss Ventura to engage in sex acts with male sex workers while masturbating and filming the encounters. Ran out of his apartment with a firearm in pursuit of a rival industry executive whom he learned was nearby. Demanded that Miss Ventura to carry his firearm in her purse just to make her uncomfortable and demonstrate how dangerous he is. And introduced Miss Ventura to a lifestyle of excessive alcohol and substance abuse and required her to procure illicit prescriptions to satisfy his own addictions. Miss Ventura met Mr. Combs in 2005, when she was 19 years old and he was 37 years old. He signed her to his label Bad Boy Records and within a few years lured Miss Ventura into an ostentatious, fast-paced, and drug-fueled lifestyle and into a romantic relationship with him, her boss, one of the most powerful men in the entertainment industry, and a vicious, cruel, and controlling man nearly two decades her senior. Mr. Combs asserted complete control over Ms. Ventura's personal and professional life, thereby ensuring her inability to escape his hold. He provided unprecedented avenues for success for the aspiring artist, but in return demanded obedience, loyalty, and silence. Throughout their relationship, Mr. Combs was prone to uncontrollable rage and frequently beat Ms. Ventura savagely. These beatings were witnessed by Mr. Combs' staff and employees of Bad Boy Entertainment and Mr. Combs' related businesses, but no one dared to speak up against their frightening and ferocious boss. Following these episodes of horrific abuse, Mr. Combs would immediately attempt to hide Miss Ventura and the evidence of his violent rage. He often showered her with gifts following incidents of physical violence, a typical pattern. He often showered her with gifts following incidents of physical violence, a typical pattern of behavior by serial abusers. In addition to the physical assaults, Mr. Combs frequently reminded Miss Ventura of his ability to cause serious harm, whether by requiring her to carry his gun in her purse or by blowing up the car of a musician that was romantically interested in Miss Ventura. Adding insult to injury, Mr. Combs used illegal substances and threats of violence to force Ms. Ventura into repeated unwanted sexual encounters with male sex workers. Over the years that Mr. Combs abused Ms. Ventura physically and sexually, she again and again tried to escape his tight hold over her life. Every time she hid, Mr. Combs' vast network of corporations and affiliated entities found her, and those who worked for Mr. Combs' companies implored her to return to him. Many went as far as to explicitly state that her failure to return to Mr. Combs would hinder her success in the entertainment industry. When she believed that she had finally separated from her longtime abuser, she joined Mr. Combs for a dinner, after which he forced her into her home and raped her while she repeatedly said no and tried to push him away. Miss Ventura has now fully escaped Mr. Combs, but the harm that the assaults and sexual abuse he caused her to experience for nearly a decade will forever haunt her. She has required intensive medical and psychological care to recover from the trauma she lived through. She cannot, however, continue to live in silence about what she endured. Mr. Combs remains immensely powerful and immensely dangerous. Ms. Ventura therefore seeks justice for the decade of her life that Mr. Combs took away from her with threats of violence, excessive drug use, physical and psychological abuse, and sexual slavery. Accordingly, 
Ms. Ventura brings us actions seeking injunctive, declaratory, and monetary relief against defendants in violation of federal sex trafficking laws, the New York State Human Rights Law, the New York City Human Rights Law NYC Administrative Code, the New York City Human Rights Law, the Gender Motivated Violence Act, the New York Services for Victims of Human Trafficking, the California Sexual Abuse and Cover-Up Accountability Act, and the California Trafficking Victims Protection Act. So jurisdiction and venue. This court has jurisdiction pursuant to 28 U.S.C., 1331 and 1343, as this action asserts violations of 18 U.S.C., 1591, and therefore raises federal questions regarding the deprivation of plaintiff's rights. The court has supplemental jurisdiction over plaintiff's related claims arising under state and city law. Pursuant to 28 U.S.C., 1391b, Venue is proper in this court because a substantial part of the events or omissions giving rise to this action, including the unlawful employment practices and intentional and negligent tortious conduct alleged herein, occurred in this district. Parties Plaintiff Cassandra Ventura is a resident of the state of California and Connecticut and was employed by defendants Bad Boy Records LLC and Bad Boy Entertainment and related entities, among them Doe Corporations 1 through 10, from 2006 to tw- at all relevant times herein. Ms. Ventura met the definition of an employee of defendants under all relevant statutes. Defendant Sean Combs, upon information and belief, resides within the state of California. At all relevant times herein, Mr. Combs met the definition of an employer of plaintiff under all relevant statutes. Defendant Bad Boy Entertainment is a music, media, and entertainment company founded by Defendant Sean Combs, which includes the record label Defendant Bad Boy Records, LLC. At all relevant times, Defendant was an employer of plaintiff within the meaning of all applicable statutes. Defendant Bad Boy Records LLC is a Delaware limited liability company with a principal place of business located in New York. At all relevant times, defendant was an employer of plaintiff within the meaning of all applicable statutes. Defendant Epic Records is a New York-based record label owned by Sony Music Entertainment, a subsidiary of Sony Corporation of America. At all relevant times, defendant was an employer of plaintiff within the meaning of all applicable statutes. Defendant Combs Enterprises LLC is a New York limited liability company At all relevant times, defendant was an employer of plaintiff within the meaning of all applicable statutes. Defendant Doe Corporations 1 through 10 are corporations and entities affiliated and associated with defendant Sean Combs and the defendant corporations. At all relevant times, defendant Doe Corporations 1 through 10 were employers of plaintiff within the meaning of all applicable statutes. Factual allegations. So first we're going to look at the early stages of when they met. Teenage Miss Ventura meets middle-aged Mr. Combs as her career begins. Ms. Ventura met Mr. Combs in late 2005 or early 2006, after Mr. Combs heard Ms. Ventura's first single playing in a club and expressed interest in signing her to his label, Bad Boy Records. At the time, Ms. Ventura was 19 years old. Mr. Combs was 37 years old. Within months, in February 2006, Ms. Ventura signed a 10-album deal with Mr. Combs' record label. Damn, 10 albums. Only one studio album. She had a second one in the works, I thought. Well, I mean, I guess we can guess what happened in that. Damn. All right, back into it. Ms. Ventura's first album, Cassie, was released in August 2006, debuting at number four on the U.S. Billboard 200. To promote the album, Ms. Ventura made television appearances on MTV's Total Request Live and BET's 106 in Park. Ms. Ventura suffered from significant performance anxiety during these appearances, and press outlets were highly critical of Ms. Ventura's performances on these shows. Mr. Combs, however, sought to rehabilitate his newly signed talent, telling MTV News, You could hear the nervousness in her voice, and to be honest, I smiled at it because it made me really appreciate what I really love about her. She's a regular person. It just made me appreciate that she got nervous, and it was cute to me, to be honest. You've got to understand that success for her is coming out of nowhere. It's just so huge, and sometimes everybody handles it differently. While clearly paternalistic in noting that it was cute to him how regular Miss Ventura appeared, Mr. Combs' comment rang true to some extent. Upon signing with Bad Boy Records, Miss Ventura was quickly thrust into the spotlight and was unfamiliar with how to navigate her new celebrity status. Mr. Combs' recognition and glorification of Miss Ventura's naivety proved to set the groundwork for his manipulative and coercive romantic and sexual relationship with Miss Ventura, a woman nearly two decades his junior. Within a year of signing with Bad Boy Records, Mr. Combs became deeply entrenched in Miss Ventura's life, almost immediately asserting possession and control over her and inserting himself into all aspects of her career and personal life. In November 2006, Mr. Combs invited Ms. Ventura to perform his song, Come to Me, along with him at the MTV MTV Europe Music Awards in Copenhagen, Denmark. After rehearsal for the performance, Mr. Combs walked around in a robe with a drink in his hand, flaunting his lavish party lifestyle to his label's newly signed artist. During hair and makeup leading up to the performance, Ms. Ventura's hairstylist and Mr. Combs' makeup artist told Ms. Ventura that Mr. Combs was interested in Ms. Ventura. 
Ms. Ventura shrugged off the gossip and, and in fact, just expressed disgust, given the large age gap between her and the president of her record label. Emphasizing the age and power dynamic early on in their working relationship, Mr. Combs positioned himself as a father figure and protector of Ms. Ventura. By way of example, after returning to New York after a trip to Las Vegas, during which she endured a brief hospital stay, Ms. Ventura, who by then was fully healthy, went out to a club with her friends. When Mr. Combs saw her out, he reprimanded her, telling her to go home and take care of herself. At the time, Ms. Ventura thought that her record label was looking out for her well-being and that Mr. Combs had her best interest in mind. Mr. Combs also inserted he was intertwined with Ms. Ventura's personal and social life, for instance, by inviting himself to Ms. Ventura's 21st birthday party in Las Vegas. He also brought along famous musicians and producers, thereby flaunting his celebrity status and influence in front of a young and impressionable Ms. Ventura. Although Mr. Combs knew that Ms. Ventura was in a relationship at the time, and even though he was publicly in a relationship with Kim Porter, Mr. Combs nevertheless pursued Ms. Ventura. At an after-party in a hotel suite following Ms. Ventura's 21st birthday party, Mr. Combs pulled Ms. Ventura into a bathroom and forcibly kissed her. Ms. Ventura did not consent to this unwanted contact. She immediately ran out of the bathroom in the hotel suite and cried. She told her best friend at the time about what happened, but was too scared to tell anyone else. At the Video Music Awards the following day, Ms. Ventura's boyfriend at the time joined her and Mr. Combs at a table at the awards ceremony. Mr. Combs became angry, telling Ms. Ventura that the invitation to the awards ceremony was only for her and not for her significant other. Mr. Combs lures Ms. Ventura into a relationship. Despite her clear rejection of Mr. Combs' advances, Mr. Combs continued to demand Ms. Ventura spend time with him, including for a weekend at Mr. Combs' residence in Miami and for nights out in New York City. On one particular night around September 2007, Mr. Combs insisted on taking Ms. Ventura out. Ms. Ventura acquiesced, fearing that rejecting Mr. Combs' request would have repercussions for her album deal with Mr. Combs and his company, Bad Boy Records. Mr. Combs picked Ms. Ventura up from her restaurant in Manhattan in a blue luxury vehicle. Ms. Ventura was surprised that when she got into the car, Mr. Combs was already inebriated. He handed her a pill and told her to take it. When Ms. Ventura asked what the pill was, Mr. Combs dismissed her and told her she would like it. She later learned the pill was ecstasy, something Ms. Ventura had never before tried and did not want to try. This was the first time Mr. Combs got Ms. Ventura high. Mr. Combs then proceeded to drive recklessly at very high speeds down the west side highway of Manhattan. Ms. Ventura was very scared, but did not dare to object to Mr. Combs, who appeared drunk, high, and agitated. Mr. Combs took Ms. Ventura to an upscale lounge in downtown Manhattan, where he proceeded to get into an altercation with the security staff who would not permit Mr. Combs to enter, presumably because he was belligerent. Ms. Ventura decided to go home, but for the remainder of the night, Mr. Combs messaged Ms. Ventura incessantly, complaining that he left, complaining that she left him high and alone, maybe? In early 2007, Mr. Combs flexed his power and influence when he paid a promoter to create a fake flyer for a party hosted by Ms. Ventura. This fake posting allowed Ms. Ventura to have an excuse to go to Miami, Florida, and get her away from her boyfriend by using the guise of a legitimate event she had to attend. Ms. Ventura was stunned at how easily Mr. Combs was able to recruit others to lie for him. Ms. Ventura was uncomfortable with the fake flyer, but because the request to go to Miami was made by the owner of her record label, and because she was scared to go against his wishes and face repercussions for her nascent career, Ms. Ventura agreed to join Mr. Combs in Florida. During this trip to Miami, Mr. Combs provided Ms. Ventura with copious amounts of drugs. She became more intoxicated than she ever had before, and her intoxication lasted throughout the weekend trip. As she wanted Mr. Combs to continue to support her career, she felt she could not refuse Mr. Combs' urgence for her to take more drugs. After providing her with drugs, Mr. Combs had sexual intercourse with Ms. Ventura during this trip. Within two years of meeting Mr. Combs, Ms. Ventura found herself lured into the immediate circle of her boss, the owner of her record label, and one of the most powerful men in the entertainment industry. Mr. Combs exerts control over Ms. Ventura's career and personal life. From the very start of their relationship, Mr. Combs exerted his power and influence over Ms. Ventura. This dynamic was fueled by their nearly 20-year age difference, as well as their relative positions in the entertainment industry, with Mr. Combs considered a music mogul and Ms. Ventura at the very start of her career as an entertainer. Mr. Combs' aggressive and demanding approach to those he worked with made it impossible for anyone to challenge him, and Ms. Ventura soon learned that Mr. Combs insisted on blind loyalty from everyone in his inner circle. Although Ms. Ventura had saved up some earnings from her young modeling career, Mr. Combs' ostentatious display of wealth was intimidating to her. Mr. Combs paid for all things with wads of cash and would repeatedly tell Ms. Ventura, don't worry about the money, I have money. Mr. Combs expensed lavish vacations for him and Ms. Ventura, purchased a car for her, paid for her apartment, and provided her with extensive amounts of designer clothing. Around 2008 or 2009, Mr. Combs began to rent an apartment in Manhattan for Ms. Ventura. The apartment was within walking distance of Mr. Combs' New York residence. He first showed Ms. Ventura the apartment by bringing her there along with her parents. Ms. Ventura's parents were skeptical of the mogul's display of wealth, but proud of their daughter's newfound success. Around 2010, Mr. Combs similar, 
similarly paid for an apartment for Ms. Ventura in Los Angeles, which was located about five minutes away from Mr. Combs's residence. He paid for many of her apartments in California and also purchased a Jaguar for her around 2013 or 2014. The car, not the animal. Jaguar. All aspects of Ms. Ventura's life were controlled by either Mr. Combs or his management companies. Every event Ms. Ventura attended, from the travel to the makeup and the clothing, was paid for directly by Mr. Combs and his affiliated companies. Compounding this all-encompassing intrusion into her life, Mr. Combs secured his control over the young and impressionable Miss Ventura by introducing her to a drug-fueled lifestyle that kept her complacent and compliant. Mr. Combs first introduced Miss Ventura to opiates around 2008 and would often have pills and other drugs out in the open like candy. Upon information and belief, Mr. Combs has been addicted to prescription painkillers and took ecstasy frequently. At first, Ms. Ventura was given the prescriptions that Mr. Combs received from a doctor in Miami, Florida. Eventually, when Mr. Combs exhausted his supply of pills, he demanded that Ms. Ventura procure prescriptions from this Miami doctor in her own name. Mr. Combs also became deeply involved in Ms. Ventura's personal life, with his personal staff attending to Ms. Ventura's day-to-day -day travel and other needs, including medical care. On multiple occasions, Mr. Combs had Ms. Ventura's personal medical records sent directly to his email address. For instance, when Ms. Ventura began experiencing memory loss, potentially due to excessive drug use and or head injuries caused by Mr. Combs' beatings, as described below, her MRI results were provided directly to Mr. Combs. Mr. Combs also repeatedly arranged for his staff to drive Ms. Ventura to certain doctor's appointments. In this way, Mr. Combs exerted ownership over Ms. Ventura. As another example of the ways in which he manipulated Ms. Ventura and ensured obedience, early on in their relationship, he asked Ms. Ventura what she called her grandfather. When Ms. Ventura said that she referred to her grandfather as Pop Pop, Mr. Combs perversely insisted that Ms. Ventura refer him, refer to him with that nickname. Mr. Combs and Ms. Ventura's relationship becomes violent and abusive. What started as a whirlwind of celebrity meetings and drug and alcohol-fueled parties, however, quickly turned frightening and violent. Ms. Ventura was also exposed to the intense violence that pervaded Mr. Combs' rise to fame. For example, on one occasion when Mr. Combs and Ms. Ventura were using drugs together in his home, one of his security staff barged in and announced that Suge Knight, a longtime rival of Mr. Combs, was spotted at Mel's Drive-In Diner in Los Angeles. Mr. Combs began to get dressed, retrieved multiple guns from a safe, and ran out of his home to where he believed Mr. Knight was dining. Ms. Ventura became terrified and began to cry. On at least two occasions, Mr. Combs demanded that Ms. Ventura hold Mr. Combs' gun in her purse. Ms. Ventura had no familiarity with guns and was petrified that the firearm would ac accidentally go off in her purse. There was no clear reason why Mr. Combs required her to hold his guns, except to reinforce to his young girlfriend that he was violent, powerful, and dangerous. I'm going to pause there, because I'm not sure if this is how Cassie's characterizing this, or if this is just how the attorneys are writing this, but... I don't necessarily think that that's a clear reason that someone, someone holds the gun in the purse. And that's not to say that that's not like a peer pressure situation either way, but I don't think that's the only explanation why someone might carry someone else's gun in their purse that they're in a relationship with. Like, that's a Lil Wayne line. Like, I've got my gun in my boo purse. Small detail. Moving forward. Over the next decade, multiple times each year, Mr. Combs would violently beat Miss Ventura, leaving bruises on her body. After every instance in which he beat Miss Ventura, Mr. Combs used his money and power to orchestrate extensive efforts to hide the evidence of his abuse, including by hiding Miss Ventura in hotels for days at a time to let her bruises heal. In one such instance, after a party with Jay-Z, Mr. Combs beat Miss Ventura repeatedly in an escalade, including by kicking and hitting her. He forced her out of the vehicle on Fifth Avenue in New York City. She was eventually able to hail a cab and get to her apartment in Manhattan, where she cried in fear, realizing there was no one she could tell about what happened at the hands of this incredibly powerful man. She spent the subsequent three days hiding in her apartment. In January 2009, after Mr. Combs learned that Miss Ventura spoke to another music manager at a party in Los Angeles, he became enraged. She had hoped speaking to this manager would allow her to further grow her career, and that Mr. Combs would be happy for her. But instead, he became extremely angry and pulled her out of the club where the party was taking place. In the car leaving the club, Mr. Combs beat Miss Ventura, pushing her into a corner of the vehicle and stomping on her face. Mr. Combs' security staff, Roger Bonds, tried to stop the beating. So is he going to show up? He did a Vlad TV thing. So I'm going to note this interview in my scratch pad. Feel free to look that up or check that out. But they're naming Roger Bonds here. And I wonder, I wonder if they're going to call him, if they might have a statement from him. But anyway, in the car leaving the club, Mr. Combs beat Miss Ventura, pushing her into the corner of a vehicle and stomping on her face. Mr. Combs' security staff, Roger Bonds, tried to stop the beating, but was unable to de-escalate the situation. When the car arrived at Mr. Combs' residence, Miss Ventura attempted to run away, but Mr. Combs followed her and proceeded to again kick her in the face. 
Miss Ventura was bleeding profusely and was ushered into Mr. Combs's home, where she began to throw up from the violent assault. Upon recognizing the damage he had done and the physical evidence of his abuse, Mr. Combs panicked and forced his staff to bring Miss Ventura to a hotel suite at the London Hotel in Los Angeles, where she was required to stay for a week. During the stay, as her injuries from the beating healed, Miss Ventura began to fully realize that Mr. Combs's tremendously loyal network not only knew about and witnessed his assault, but also that these witnesses were not willing to do anything meaningful to stop Mr. Combs's behavior. She recognized that she was powerless and that reporting Mr. Combs to the authorities would not alter Mr. Combs' status or influence, but would merely give Mr. Combs another excuse to hurt her. While in the hotel, she asked to go home to her parents, but Mr. Combs wouldn't let her leave. She lied to her mother when asked about an online gossip forum that reported the assault. Mr. Combs proceeded to instruct his assistant to purchase excessive amounts of gifts from Miss Ventura, which were delivered to the hotel room where she remained trapped. Miss Ventura was terrified, isolated, and unable to see a pathway out of Mr. Combs' abusive hold on her life. She found herself becoming numb to the abuse she was experiencing and became entirely beholden to Mr. Combs's demands. She began to blindly follow his instructions out of fear of again being on the receiving end of a vicious beating. By Mr. Combs's own admission, his relationship with Miss Ventura was like a Bobby and Whitney, a clear acknowledgement of the unequal power dynamic and excessive domestic violence that permeated their relationship. From the outside looking in, Miss Ventura had heard others refer to his relationship with Mr. Combs as akin to Ike and Tina. Her volatile and abusive partner, who also owned her label and therefore held her future success in his hands, had fully exerted control over every aspect of her life. Mr. Combs forces Miss Ventura into sex trafficking. Within a few months of beginning a romantic relationship with the 40-year-old Mr. Combs, the 22-year-old Miss Ventura felt beholden to his whims and demands. While in New York City, Mr. Combs told the, told the Miss Ventura that he wanted to engage in a fantasy of his called voyeurism. Mr. Combs said that it would turn him on if he saw Miss Ventura with another dick. Telling you, man, that's get him to the Greek, wasn't it? The first time, Mr. Combs hired a man and brought the man to his home in Los Angeles. The man, Mr. Combs, and Miss Ventura wore masks and ingested drugs. Mr. Combs directed Miss Ventura to perform sexual acts with this man while Mr. Combs watched them. He masturbated while he directed Miss Ventura and the man to do specific sexual acts. The entire, oof, geez. The entire encounter lasted multiple days. Mr. Combs began to call the arrangement a freak off or F.O., he would repeatedly tell Miss Ventura at random moments that he wanted an FO, and Miss Ventura was eventually expected to facilitate the location and the hiring of male sex workers. At certain points during Miss Ventura and Mr. Combs' relationship, he would insist on an FO weekly. Mr. Combs would repeatedly tell Miss Ventura that this practice was our thing and our secret. Well, not anymore. FOs would often take place in hotel suites, including at the Trump International Hotel in Columbus Circle, L'Hermitage Beverly Hills, the London Hotel in Los Angeles, the Intercontinental Century City, the Intercontinental Atlanta, the Intercontinental New York City, the One Hotel in New York and in Miami, the Mandarin Oriental Hotel in New York and Miami, the Fontainebleau in Miami, the Beverly Hills Hotel, and Shutters on the Beach in Los Angeles. That's a lot. That could fill a travel book. On one occasion around 2013, Mr. Combs had an FO set up at the Intercontinental Hotel in New York City, after which he was charged with tens of thousands of dollars in damages by the hotel. Upon information and belief, Mr. Combs' chief of staff, Tony Fletcher, paid the invoice charged by the hotel. Ms. Ventura was eventually instructed to use websites and escort services to find male sex workers to participate in the FOs. Mr. Combs told Ms. Ventura to search for large black penises on the website. Sometimes, Mr. Combs would pay to fly male sex workers to his location, including to multiple cities in the United States as well as abroad. He required Ms. Ventura and his staff to help him make these arrangements. Mr. Combs' assistants would help to set up the FOs, including by setting up the hotel suites with baby oil and Astroglide. Mr. Combs always supplied Ms. Ventura and the sex worker with copious amounts of drugs before and during the FOs. Ms. Ventura was given ecstasy, cocaine, GHB, ketamine, marijuana, and, and alcohol in excessive amounts during FOs, which allowed her to dissociate from these horrific encounters. It became commonplace to get IV fluids in the days after an FO to recover from the excessive substances pushed upon her. Miss Ventura was required to dress up in lingerie for an FO, and Mr. Combs insisted she wear white nail polish to contrast her nails with the skin of the black man he hired to have sex with her. During the FO, Mr. Combs would instruct Miss Ventura to pour excessive amounts of oil over herself. Mr. Combs would then instruct Miss Ventura and the sex workers to speak to each other, and then he and then would specifically tell Miss Ventura where to touch the sex workers. Mr. Combs would say things like, grab that big black dick and ask her how does it feel, as he directed her to perform for him. During the FOs, in addition to directing Miss Ventura and masturbating, Mr. Combs would use his phone, laptop, and tablet to film Miss Ventura having sex with the hired sex worker. He treated the forced encounter as a personal art project, 
adjusting the candles he used for lighting to frame the videos he took. While Ms. Ventura quickly deleted any photographs or videos of sex act if they were taken on her phone, Mr. Combs repeatedly made clear that he retained many videos of Ms. Ventura made during FOs. Even when she deleted the videos, Mr. Combs would tell Ms. Ventura that he was able to recover deleted files from her devices. On one occasion, he sat next to her on a flight and made her watch a video she thought she had deleted, reinforcing her inability to escape and immense power he held over her. Mr. Combs would pay the male sex workers a few thousand dollars in cash for their services. During some FOs, Mr. Combs would become extremely intoxicated and would hit Ms. Ventura in front of the male sex workers. Ms. Ventura was repulsed by Mr. Combs's demands. Between the physical beating and, the, and recognizing his incredible power and incredible temper, Ms. Ventura became petrified of her partner and boss and felt that she could not say no. He even would present her with lavish gifts prior to or in the middle of the FOs, seemingly acknowledging the ways in which these forced sexual encounters constituted work for Ms. Ventura and that he needed to compensate her for this work. At one point, he had given her so many designer bracelets for FOs, and immediately following his brutal beatings, that she felt that she was shackled by his presence. Frequently, her anxiety before an FO would become so great that she would become physically ill, sometimes to the point of vomiting. While kneeling over the toilet, Mr. Combs would shame her into performing for him, eventually forcing her to get up and proceed with the encounter. She knew firsthand that telling Mr. Combs that she did not want to engage in FOs was met with anger and violence. In addition, any suggestion that Ms. Ventura would refuse the FO or otherwise report Mr. Combs' abuse was met with ultimatums by Mr. Combs, who would say that Ms. Ventura could not go to the police because she had a lot to lose. Around August 2015, for example, in the middle of a surprise birthday dinner for Ms. Ventura's 29th birthday, Mr. Combs insisted that Ms. Ventura leave the party to go to a hotel for an FO. When she expressed that she did not want to go, Mr. Combs had Ms. Ventura cornered by his security staff and ordered to force her to leave with him. After this FO, Mr. Combs and Ms. Ventura went back to the hotel room that Ms. Ventura was staying in, where some of Ms. Ventura's friends were already hanging out. Mr. Combs was severely intoxicated and at one point during the night picked up one of Ms. Ventura's friends like a child and dangled the friend over the balcony of the 17th floor hotel suite. Ms. Ventura and her friends were scared by Mr. Combs' erratic behavior, but Ms. Ventura was heavily sedated because of the drugs she took to participate in the FO and therefore was unable to respond to Mr. Combs' terrifying behavior. The FOs became work for Ms. Ventura, and despite her protestations, Mr. Combs insisted on these intricately staged and forced sexual encounters between Ms. Ventura and various male sex workers. Ms. Ventura tries to escape Mr. Combs' abuse. Anytime she tried to create distance between her and Mr. Combs, he used his networks to find her and convince her to return to his abuse. On multiple occasions, Mr. Combs sent his employees to lure Ms. Ventura back. In 2011, during a rough patch in Mr. Combs and Ms. Ventura's relationship, Ms. Ventura had a brief relationship with musician Kid Cudi. When Mr. Combs returned from a trip, he demanded another FO of Ms. Ventura. She, acquies she acquiesced. During this FO, Mr. Combs found Ms. Ventura's phone and found emails between her and Kid Cudi. Mr. Combs became enraged and proceeded to place a manual corkscrew between his fingers and lunged at Ms. Ventura. Ms. Ventura ran away to stay at Kid Cudi's home to escape Mr. Combs' wrath. Soon thereafter, one of Mr. Combs' staff members told Ms. Ventura that he needed to just talk to Mr. Combs, even though Mr. Combs was enraged. I don't know if that means she needed or he needed, but it says he. Feeling like she could not escape Mr. Combs and his network of enforcers, Miss Ventura returned to Mr. Combs. He hit her several times and then kicked her in the back as she tried to run out the door. She went to her parents' home in Connecticut, where her mother took pictures of the bruises Mr. Combs had left on Miss Ventura's body. In February 2012, during Paris Fashion Week, Mr. Combs told Miss Ventura that he was going to blow up Kid Cudi's car and that he wanted to ensure that Kid Cudi was home with his friends when it happened. Around that time, Kid Cudi's car exploded in his driveway. Ms. Ventura was terrified as she began to fully comprehend what Mr. Combs was both willing and able to do to those he believed had slighted him. In 2015, Ms. Ventura spoke to a popular music manager at a party in a hotel suite in Las Vegas. Mr. Combs saw her speaking to this manager and sternly told her to step into the bedroom adjoining the suite. In the bedroom, Mr. Combs beat Ms. Ventura severely. She ran from corner to corner of the room, trying to avoid Mr. Combs beating and kicking. When she tried to lock herself in the bathroom, he pushed through and punched and kicked her while she was curled up under the toilet. Her screams were drowned out by the loud music playing in the outside area of the hotel suite. When Mr. Combs had a security and assistant saw Ms. Ventura after the assault, they began to cry. Ms. Ventura had two black eyes, a burst and bruised lip, and a, huge and a huge welt on her forehead. Upon seeing the results of his vicious attack, Mr. Combs immediately took steps to conceal his wrongdoing. He forced Ms. Ventura to stay at his home in Holmby Hills, along with one of his sons. While there, Mr. Combs FaceTimed Ms. Ventura and stated, You gotta go up and put more makeup on. My son can't see you like that. She did put makeup on, per Mr. Combs' demands. Ms. Ventura felt that she had no choice but to obey her abuser, even though security guards, assistants, and friends saw the situation she was in. No one dared to help her or speak up on her behalf. She therefore had no choice but to remain subservient. 
Later in 2015, while shooting a movie in Cape Town, South Africa, Miss Ventura began a flirtatious relationship with an actor. She spent New Year's Eve with this actor, but Mr. Combs soon found out. Mr. Combs called the actor and threatened him. The actor proceeded to call Miss Ventura and tell her, you really need to call Mr. Combs. In or around March 2016, during an FO at the Intercontinental Hotel in Century City, Los Angeles, Mr. Combs became extremely intoxicated and punched Miss Ventura in the face, giving her a black eye. After he fell asleep, Miss Ventura tried to leave the hotel room, but as she exited, Mr. Combs awoke and began screaming at Miss Ventura. He followed her into the hallway of the hotel while yelling at her. He grabbed her and then took glass vases in the hallway and threw them at her, causing glass to crash around them as she ran to the elevator to escape. She managed to get into the elevator, and when she got to the lobby, quickly took a cab to her apartment. Upon realizing that her running away would cause Mr. Combs to be even angrier with her, and completely stuck in his vicious cycle of abuse, Miss Ventura returned to the hotel with the intention of apologizing for running away from her abuser. When she returned, hotel security staff urged her to get back into the cab and go to her apartment, suggesting that they had seen the security footage showing Mr. Combs beating Miss Ventura and throwing glass at her in the hallway. Upon information and belief, Mr. Combs paid the Intercontinental Century City $50,000 for the hallway security footage from that evening. After this, Miss Ventura left her home in Comstock and went to hide away at a friend's home in Florida. James Cruz, president of Bad Boy Management, tracked Miss Ventura down and told her that her single would not be released if she did not answer Mr. Combs's phone calls. A woman who worked at Sony Music reached out to her with similar ultimatum, with a similar ultimatum concerning her record. Incredibly, Mr. Combs even convinced one of his attorneys to call Miss Ventura at this time. This lawyer told Miss Ventura that it's in your best interest to call Mr. Combs back. Each time Miss Ventura tried to run away, Mr. Combs and his powerful network would force her back to him. Mr. Combs's tight hold over her life had irreparably damaged her friendships. Around 2018, when Miss Ventura was with her friend Carrie Morgan in her house, Mr. Combs used his key to Miss Ventura's house and came in unannounced. He and Miss Morgan had an altercation, during which Mr. Combs threw a hanger at Miss Morgan. Upon information and belief, the incident resulted in a settlement between Mr. Combs and Mrs. Morgan, and Miss Ventura ended up paying Miss Morgan additional funds in an attempt to resolve the dispute between her close friend and her abusive and controlling boyfriend. The relationship between Miss Ventura, between Miss Ventura and Miss Morgan has been strained since this time. Seeing the extreme measures Mr. Combs took to keep a tight hold on Miss Ventura and isolate her from her support network, and having experienced the repercussions of rejecting his demands, Miss Ventura felt that saying no to Mr. Combs would cost her something, her family, her friends, her career, or even her life. Mr. Combs rapes Miss Ventura. By 2017 and 2018, Miss Ventura became desperate to leave Mr. Combs and his abuse of her. She recognized that if she stayed with him, she would never be able to have a successful career or ever be physically and mentally safe. She therefore became determined to completely break away from Mr. Combs and his cycle of abuse and made concerted efforts to avoid him. In September 2018, she joined Mr. Combs for a dinner at an Italian restaurant in Malibu, California, for what she believed would be a discussion about concluding their relationship for good. After dinner, Mr. Combs and Miss Ventura ventured to Miss Ventura's home, which was paid for by Mr. Combs. Mr. Combs forced himself into her apartment and tried to kiss Miss Ventura. She told him to stop and attempted to push him away. Mr. Combs then forcibly pulled off Miss Ventura's clothing and unbuckled his belt. He proceeded to rape Miss Ventura while she repeatedly said no and tried to push him away. Soon thereafter, Miss Ventura took steps to completely separate herself from her longtime abuser, including by leaving the home that he paid for and returning the car he purchased for her. Despite moving away, Miss Ventura's address was posted online in early 2019, leading to fears for her safety. Miss Ventura, who was under immense duress during the months after Mr. Combs raped her, took all possible steps to entirely remove herself from her abuser's ambit, including by entering into contracts and her record deal with Bad Boy Entertainment. Mr. Combs' sexual and physical abuse of Miss Ventura has caused her lifelong harm. As a result of the immense trauma Miss Ventura has endured for over a decade with Mr. Combs, she has suffered and continues to suffer from immense emotional distress. Following her escape from the cycle of abuse and sex trafficking she endured, she struggled with the physical and mental manifestations of her trauma. The birth of her two children, however, allowed her a new lease on life and gave her purpose. She credits her children with saving her from the trauma that had consumed over a decade of her life. Except for the months when she was pregnant with her children, Miss Ventura struggled with her addictions to alcohol and drugs, addictions that were established and fueled by Mr. Combs. She turned to substances to drown out the memories of her abuse. Without being intoxicated, she suffered from horrific nightmares of the forced sexual acts that Mr. Combs demanded she participate in during the regularly scheduled FOs and of the physical beatings that she endured during her relationship. She had difficulty eating or sleeping, and her relationships with her family suffered. During this time, she frequently had thoughts of ending her life. To rebuild her life and career, Miss Ventura needed to completely reinvent herself. She checked herself into inpatient treatment at a rehab center, where she first confronted the extent of the trauma she lived with. 
She has required intensive therapy and other medical care to recover from Mr. Combs's abuse, and she will forever live with the physical and psychological repercussions of the over a decade of violence, fear, and exploitation she endured. Although Ms. Ventura was unable to speak up against the years of abuse she endured at the hands of Mr. Combs, she has since been able to rebuild her life and confront her trauma. Thanks to the passage of the New York Adult Survivors Act and California's Sexual Abuse Accountability and Cover-Up Act, she is now ready and able to confront her abuser and to hold him and those who enabled his abuse accountable for their actions. So we get to the first cause of action, sex trafficking under 18 U.S.C. 1591 against all defendants. Plaintiff is a victim of sex trafficking within the meaning of 18 U.S.C. 1591 A and B, and therefore entitled to bring a civil action under 18 U.S.C. 1595. The defendant's acts and omissions, taken separately and or together, as outlined above, constitute a violation of 18 U.S.C. 1595. Specifically, defendant Sean Combs perpetrated sex trafficking of Ms. Ventura by requiring her to engage in forced sexual acts in multiple jurisdictions, and all defendants benefited from Mr. Combs's venture by holding Ms. Ventura, an artist signed with defendant Bad Boy Records and otherwise employed by other defendant Doe corporations, captive to Mr. Combs's demands and desires. At all relevant times, defendants participated in and facilitated the harboring and transportation of plaintiff for purposes of sex induced by force, fraud, or coercion. The defendant corporations have financially and otherwise benefited as a result of these acts and omissions by keeping Mr. Combs, the volatile and explosive owner of the defendant corporations, satisfied. They benefited from facilitating this behavior to the extent it kept the mercurial music mogul happy and kept Ms. Ventura obedient to Mr. Combs and the corporation's interest. Defendant Combs and Defendant Bad Boy Records, Bad Boy Entertainment, and Doe Corporations 1-10 through formed a venture as defined by 18 U.S.C. 1591 given that they constituted a group of two or more individuals associated in fact, whether or not a legal entity. As a direct and proximate result of defendant's unlawful conduct as alleged here and above, plaintiff has suffered physical injury, severe emotional distress and anxiety, humiliation, embarrassment, post-traumatic stress disorder, economic harm, and consequential damages. Plaintiff also seeks reasonable attorney fees as provided under 18 U.S.C. 1595A. Second cause of action, violation of the New York Services for Victims of Human Trafficking against all defendants. And then they are repeating the same thing, but they are using the New York state laws to bring the same cause of action that plaintiff is a victim of sex trafficking. Third cause of action, it's violation of the California Trafficking Victims Protection Act against all defendants. Fourth cause of action, Battery, sexual battery under New York law against defendant Sean Combs. Plaintiff repeats and realleges every each and every allegation in all of the preceding paragraphs as if fully set forth herein. In performing the conduct described above, defendant committed a battery against plaintiff because he intentionally engaged in unlawful, intentional, and offensive touching or application of force to plaintiff's person. As a result of Mr. Combs's alleged conduct, plaintiff has suffered physical injury, severe emotional distress, humiliation, embarrassment anxiety, economic harm, and other consequential damages. The conduct of Mr. Combs described above was willful, wanton, and malicious. At all relevant times, Mr. Combs acted with conscious disregard of plaintiff's rights and feelings, acted with the knowledge of or with the reckless disregard for the fact that his conduct was certain to cause injury and or humiliation to plaintiff, and intended to cause fear, physical injury, and or pain and suffering to the plaintiff. By virtue of the foregoing, Plaintiff is entitled to recover punitive and exemplary damages from Mr. Combs, according to proof at trial. Fifth cause of action, sexual assault pursuant to the California Sexual Abuse and Cover-Up Accountability Act against all defendants. Defendant Mr. Combs subjected plaintiff to se- sexual abuse, sexual battery, rape, and forcible act of sexual penita- penetration. In doing so, he intended to and did cause harm and sexually offensive contact with their person and placed them in imminent apprehension of such contact. Defendant corporations were entities engaged in a cover-up as defined by California Civil Code 34016-4A. Because defendant corporations took concerted efforts to hide evidence relating to the above-described sexual assaults that incentivized individuals to remain silent or prevented information relating to the sexual assaults from becoming public. As a direct and proximate result of defendant's unlawful conduct as alleged here and above, plaintiff has suffered physical injury, severe emotional distress and anxiety, humiliation, embarrassment, post-traumatic stress disorder, economic harm, and other consequential damages. Sixth cause of action, violation of the Victims of Gender Motivated Violence Act, New York City, against all defendants. The above-described conduct of defendant Mr. Combs, including but not limited to Mr. Combs's repeated physical and sexual assaults of plaintiff in New York City, constitutes a crime of violence and a crime of violence motivated by gender against plaintiff, 
The term crime of violence means an act or series of acts that would constitute a misdemeanor or felony against the person as defined in state or federal law, or that would constitute a misdemeanor or felony against property as defined in state or federal law if the conduct presents a serious risk of injury to another, whether or not these acts have actually resulted in criminal charges, prosecution, or conviction. And the term crime of violence motivated by gender means a crime of violence committed because of the gender or on the basis of gender and due, at least in part, to an animus based on the victim's gender. Defendant corporations enabled Mr. Combs's commission of the crime of violence motivated by gender and are therefore also liable. As a direct and proximate result of the aforementioned crime of violence and gender-motivated violence, plaintiff has sustained and will continue to sustain monetary damages, physical injury, pain and suffering, and serious psychological and emotional distress, entitling her to an award of, of compensatory and punitive damages, injunctive and declaratory relief, attorney's fees and costs, and other remedies as this court may deem appropriate damages. The above-described conduct of defendant Mr. Combs constitutes a sexual offense as defined in Article 130 of the New York Penal Law. This cause of action is timely because it is commenced within two years and six months after September 1, 2022. Seventh cause of action. Sexual harassment, gender discrimination, and hostile work environment under New York State Human Rights Law. Defendants discriminated against plaintiff on the basis of her gender in violation of the New York State Human Rights Law by subjecting plaintiff to disparate treatment based on her gender, including but not limited to subjecting her to sexual assault and or harassment, rape, and a hostile work environment. As a direct and proximate result of defendants' unlawful discriminatory conduct in violation of the New York State Human Rights Law, plaintiff has suffered and continues to suffer severe mental anguish and emotional distress, for which she is entitled an award of monetary damages and other relief. Defendants' unlawful and discriminatory acts were intentional, done with malice, and or showed a deliberate, willful, wanton, and reckless indifference to plaintiff's rights under New York State's human rights law, for which defendant is entitled to an award of punitive damages. This action is timely because it falls within the Adult Survivors Act and is brought during the one-year time period set forth in that section. The claims brought herein allege intentional and negligent acts and or omissions for physical, psychological, and other injuries suffered as a result of conduct that would constitute sexual offenses as defined in Article 130 of the New York Penal Law, and such acts and or omissions were committed against Ms. Ventura when she was over 18 years of age. We're almost there, guys. Eighth cause of action. Sexual harassment, gender discrimination, hostile work environment under New York City human rights law. So this is the same. It's the same text, except it's the New York City Human Rights Law, but they're still using the timeliness of the Adult Survivors Act. Prayer for Relief Wherefore, plaintiff prays judgment be entered in her favor against defendants, and each of them as follows. For a money judgment representing compensatory damages, including consequential damages, lost wages, earning, I think that might mean earnings, and all other sums of money, together with interest on those amounts, according to proof. For a money judgment for mental pain and anguish and severe emotional distress, according to proof. For punitive and exemplary damages, according to proof. For attorney's fees and costs. For prejudgment and post-judgment interest. And for such other and further relief as the court may deem just and proper. So again, this was filed November 16th, that's today, in New York. And it was submitted by Douglas Wigder. It's also signed by Meredith Firetog, Michael Williman. And then it has the Wigder Law contact information. So that is the complaint. Now, there were some important parts there where we have Kid Cudi's team confirming that the car blew up, although I don't think that they're giving a statement that, yes, it was Diddy that did it. We've got mentions of Suge Knight in there. We've got mentions of Roger Bonds by name, the security that tried to get Diddy to stop hitting her in the car. So the name is dropped. Who knows if they've already spoken to him? We don't know what proof they have. There isn't an appendix here that's showing certain things. There aren't included pictures of anything. Sometimes those things are included in a complaint, but just because they're not included in the complaint does not mean that they don't exist or that they won't be presented as appropriate. But with that being said, what are your thoughts so far? What stood out to you so far? I've got a bunch of thoughts flying around, but I didn't expect to be covering this story today or at all. You never expect these stories to come out. But just for full transparency, I hear something like this, and I'm personally not surprised to hear things about Diddy having aggression issues. And I'm not that into entertainment news, but, you know, I'm pretty sure there's there's Carisha peeing on. There's something like that's floating around in my head. I'm pretty sure there's been rumors circulating about Diddy and other men, because I don't think a single female sex worker was mentioned in any of these allegations. But other than that, I mean... 
I want to know about this $50,000 payment. I want to hear from Roger Bonds. If the parents have the injuries, the pictures of the injuries, and if I sit here and ask myself, what would make me push my own kind of background thoughts on Diddy aside and take what she's saying and question it fervently would be, did she really come and, and request $30 million from him? And they both apparently, according to their attorneys and statements from their camps, she says he tried to pay her not to bring this forward. He says she tried to get money to not bring it forward. I don't think that just because money was involved or money was offered, that always necessarily means that someone's admitting guilt or someone's trying to blackmail someone. I don't always think that. But I always want to know more about it. So I'll have more thoughts on this as this goes on. But I think some of this stuff doesn't sound so good. You have all these different hotels. You have some possible... Someone knows something about $15,000 being paid for one of the footages. I mean, if we get any of that, that would really substantiate a lot of what's being said here. So it would no longer be a story on paper. It would be kind of damn ditty. But yeah, I hope everyone's doing really well. I welcome your opinions, your thoughts, your comments. You know, any of that context that you think is relevant or want to talk about, I'm always open to either in the comments here or if you find me over on Twitter, whatever the case may be. And if you want to dive into any of the links I pulled up during this, check the description. I'll throw in what I call my scratch pad. It's my little document of everything as I'm trying to quickly put together a video to get some information together. When we get a response, if there's another filing or if some information starts to come out, make sure you're subscribed or hit the like button to signal to YouTube, show me the next video on this topic from her. And until then, take care, everybody.